So, welcome to IG Live. Uh, nobody's here yet. One person's here. Two people are here. So, uh, no, what's interesting is no real data about the coronavirus or even the economy is that interesting right now for the first time. I like the fact that there's not interesting news. Hey there, Joe. How's it going? Um, why is turtles? I don't know. Uh, and, uh, Jay, uh, you could send me the IG, the, the questions of the day. I don't know if you're, if you're around, but I unfortunately forgot my email password, so I can't log in unless I get it on my phone, which is on the stand. So a couple of things that are interesting. One is it's going to be very interesting to see how Georgia reopens their businesses. Now, Georgia's interesting because... Uh, someone's asking, how am I dealing with getting a haircut? I'm obviously not getting a haircut during this time. Uh, so Georgia's reopening their economy pretty much. I mean, if they're opening up nail salons, barbershops, masseuses, and whatever else they're opening up, I don't even know everything they're opening up. They're pretty serious about opening up the economy. And so what's going on with Georgia? Everyone's kind of gleefully waiting to see. I feel like some people want deaths to go up in Georgia, and other people want, um, of course, the best to happen, which is they. Op if, if Georgia can successfully reopen their economy and there isn't a second wave all of a sudden of coronavirus or a spike in cases, then that is a good signal in the next few weeks. We'll know in like 10 to 20 days if Georgia is successful at reopening their economy because then we'll see new hospitalizations if they're not successful, but we'll, or we'll see hospitalizations down if they are successful. So we're gonna learn a lot from Georgia reopening their economy. And right, so some of this Georgia's a guinea pig and for better or for worse, they are. Like I, I hope for the best and I hope that they successfully open their economy and there's maybe there's some additional cases, but it's very few. I don't expect that they're gonna have no deaths. They probably will have some deaths related to opening the economy, that's natural. If you shut down the economy during flu season, there would be fewer deaths than if you had the economy open during flu season. I'm not comparing coronavirus to the flu. Uh, coronavirus is much more, probably more contagious, for instance. But, you, you know, the question is, Georgia is a state with 10 million people in it. Right now, there's about, I don't know, 800 deaths in the state of Georgia. So the question is, and, and, you know, the average age of death was in the late 70s, and, and that's all horrible. Nobody should die. But... The question is, were those deaths caused because, you know, nail salons were open? Were a lot of those 80 year olds getting their nails done or were they getting massages? Maybe. But it, it, it'll be interesting to see how much effect the economy has on more cases of coronavirus. So I'm not saying Georgia's doing the right thing or the wrong thing. They're definitely going against the guidelines established by the White House. And I feel like, again, some people are thinking like, oh, now we'll see that all these people are wrong and that the economy should stay shut down because there's going to be all these more deaths. And I don't know if people should be happy about more deaths just to prove a point. I'm hoping for the best for Georgia and that they reopen their economy and there's no new deaths. There'll probably be some related to the opening of the economy, but not that many. Again, there's Georgia is a state with 10 million people. This virus has been in the U.S. now for four months and... Georgia, in that time, out of those 10 million people, Georgia has had around 800 deaths. I think it's about 850 deaths. And, uh, uh, you know, with 853 deaths, that's, that's less than 1% of 1% of the population of Georgia. And I don't know how many cases there are. Maybe there's like 20,000 cases. Again, that's, that's 2%, that's 20% of 1%, it's 0.2% 0, 0 of the population of Georgia has come down with coronavirus, at least to the point where they got tested and they had severe symptoms and so on. So it's an inconsequential amount, just statistically, in terms of shutting down, you know, a multi-billion dollar, you know, tens of billions of dollar economy. And again, don't forget, for every percent the economy loses, there are also deaths, there are also fatalities. There's so much evidence coming up right now that child abuse is up, domestic violence, and so on. So we'll see. Georgia's like in a little experiment to see if you can just reopen the economy. 
And it'll be interesting because people need to make a living. Like, uh, uh, you know, right now, the, the, the U.S., the Congress just passed another stimulus bill with another, I don't know, $450 billion. Some of that is going to go to small businesses. To be honest, I'm going to tell you what I see. I don't, I don't know of a single small business that actually got loans the last time. Uh, I mean, I, I, I heard from people who said they were getting loans, and so I thought they got. But when I made some calls last night, nobody I knew actually got a small business loan. All these owners of small businesses didn't get any of the $350 billion that were allocated to small businesses. And now we hear stories about Shake Shack, Roos Chris Steakhouse, they got 10 million, 30 million, and they're returning the checks. But how many of these big business, I think there was something like 70 huge public corporations, like they were, their stocks are traded on the stock market, got loans in the Small Business Payment Protection Program, and actually none of the restaurants or stores I know here in New York City got any loans at all. So if you know of anybody who got a loan, let me know, because I don't know anybody who got a loan. And I think that's a, that's a shame. Like the entire purpose of this loan package was to, was to help out the workers. And now in this new package, they say they're going to help out the workers, but it looks like, oh, 20 billions earmarked for, you know, making surgical gowns, 10 billions earmarked for testing. Couldn't they have put that in a separate package and we could have just focused on the people who are starving? Like the average restaurant has 16 days of cash in the bank. That means every single restaurant in the country, pretty much, except for these big chains, they're already out of business. I live on, um, I live in New York City, and there I was. I just saw this restaurant, Cafe 86, that I always used to order delivery from. The stores for rent because not only did they shut down, but they shut down. Like they're closed for business. They've been in business forever, and now they're out of business. And I think that's going to happen to a lot of storefronts and a lot of restaurants particularly if they can't get access to these small business loans, but Ruth Chris Steakhouse is raking it in, Harvard University is raking it in, Shake Shack, Potbelly, all of these big chains are raking it in because I think they're viewing each business, local business in the chain as, as a small business, which is just not true. So, uh, uh, hold on a second. Um, Art Spiegelman, that cannot be the real Art Spiegelman, is it? <laughs> So if it is, shout yourself out if that's the real Art Spiegelman, author of one of my favorite graphic novels, Mouse, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it's you. Uh, but here's another thing. I noticed um, Abigail Disney, she's the granddaughter of Walt Disney. Abigail Disney was just saying how it's a shame that Disney furloughed 43,000 employees. And I agree, that is a shame, but you know, all these companies, they, they, have to, they have to be able to, just in case the economy truly collapses after, the, uh, after it reopens, which is a possibility, all these companies have to make sure they can stay in business during this time so they can rehire people, so that they can stay in business, so that they can continue doing all the things that, you know, pay, make profits and pay people. So Disney furloughed 43,000 employees, Presumably, many of those employees are getting unemployment insurance, which makes, means they're probably going to make just, I mean, in California, someone on unemployment insurance, you know, they furloughed a lot of their employees at the Disney parks. So unemployment insurance is with the extra $600 from the stimulus package, that's going to pay them as much as their salary would have paid them. So I don't blame Disney for furloughing employees. Their employees are going to be taken care of by unemployment insurance. But what's funny to me is Abigail Disney who's worth probably over a billion dollars is complaining about, you know, these, these, these Disney employees uh, being furloughed. Why, why doesn't she take some of her money? And she has a charity set aside to donate money to stop poverty in New York. First off, I don't see anybody in New York City helped by her money. There's homeless people on the street. New York City apartments are ridiculous. Like nobody can afford to live here. And What's Abigail Disney doing? She's not donating any of the money that she's supposedly donating. And she's, she's saying 43,000 Disney employees furloughed. She calls that insane. The chairman of Disney uh, has voluntarily taken a $0 salary. She was, she was complaining about his multi-million dollar salary last year. She's worth over a billion. 
She's never worked a day in her life. What are you talking about people's salaries for? Get a job or donate. Why don't you and your family, your family's worth four or five billion dollars. You can easily take care of a month's worth of salaries of Disney employees if you care so much about them being furloughed. So all this stuff, you know, and then she's calling for a wealth tax, which is fine uh, because she's got all her money in a charitable trust. So she's not going to be taxed. She's already, anybody who's already wealthy is not going to be taxed by a wealth tax. They're my, trust me when I say, if someone's a billionaire, their billion dollars is not sitting in a checking account. Their billion dollars is hidden through three or four legal layers of trusts and other companies and blah, blah. No one is taxing Abigail Disney. But here's the thing. Also, Walt Disney himself, in, in 1923, Walt Disney, the first version of the Disney film company, uh, went bankrupt in 1923. And Walt Disney had to fire all his employees. He had to borrow money from his parents and I think his brother. And he restarted, almost immediately, restarted the Disney Corporation. He created many, you know, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and all these things. And then you know what made Walt Disney his first million dollars? This is when, this is when he knew Disney was gonna be a success. It was right in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, I think it was 1937. And what happened? Someone came to him with an idea. Hey, why don't we make a watch? This guy made watches. Why don't I put Mickey Mouse on the center of a watch? So Walt Disney said, what the hell, I'll do it. Give me a, a cut of each watch. He made millions of dollars from the, Walt, from the Mickey Mouse watch. That's the first time that Walt Disney made money. He was in business for, he was in business for 17 years before his, fitness, his business finally went over the hump. And it didn't go over the hump because of an amusement park or a movie or a TV show, or even advert he used to make ads, he used to put his cartoon characters in ads. The Walt Disney Company succeeded because the Mickey Mouse watch was its first big hit. And in order for it to succeed, he had to go bankrupt first, fire his employees, borrow money, start up again, be really persistent, keep working, and then finally, someone came to him with an idea, idea sex, let's merge, let's merge uh, watches with these characters you're creating, Mickey Mouse, Boom, became a huge hit, and that's how he was successful. And so right now, again, Abigail Disney didn't go through that. She didn't go through the 17 years of pain of generating the first pieces of the wealth that she lives off of. And now she's saying, oh, you know, the chairman of Disney, who's, who makes a, a salary of zero dollars since the pandemic shut things down, he's furloughed all the park employees because the parks are closed, and it's better for these employees to get the unemployment insurance She's screaming that this is not fair. She's worth billions of dollars. Just take care of it yourself if you think. So anyway, I'm just a little tired of, there's just nonstop hypocrisy. Everyone is kind of helping, hoping people in Georgia die so that it proves that the economic shutdown is good. I'm not hoping for that. I, I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens. People like Abigail Disney don't understand What's, what's happening with these furloughed employees, how they're now accessible to unemployment insurance that's paying them more than they were making. So Abigail, unless you're gonna pay them unemployment insurance, stop talking. And here's another thing I just read in Minnesota, because we're not buying as many things, 61,000 chickens being raised on a chicken farm were just euthanized. In other words, they were killed. So where's, where's PETA? Where's all the people all the people up and down this street here in New York City who, who go to all these PETA galas in their tuxedos and whatever, where, where are all the PETA people right now complaining that 61,000 chicken were just, were just killed? And, you know, because of this economic shutdown. I was just reading another thing, how, uh, uh, you know, all, every, every level of child abuse has gone up. Uh, you know, whether a, a, a kid is disabled and no longer able to get help, you know, medical help, whether a kid's autistic with learning issues or just kids in, in bad families. Oh, here's another one. I just heard from a guy, his wife is a private investigator, a, a, a detective, and she is getting calls through the roof because turns out all these couples that are now isolating together are cheating on each other. And so all these divorces are going to spike. Uh, uh, so so what's, what's going to happen to all these? How many, everything, this is what I've been saying. 
everything that's what's going to happen five years from now is going to happen tomorrow, essentially. So if you were going to get a divorce five years from now, chances are you're going to get a divorce as soon as the economy reopens. Private detectives, their business is surging. Cannabis companies, their business is surging. Uh, uh, abuse situations are, are popping up. And, you know, again, in mil tens of millions of people unemployed. Now, unemployment insurance is hopefully taking care of a lot of that need. A lot of these people are furloughed. Certainly Disney, as soon as the economy reopens, Disney is going to rehire most, if not all, of these 43,000 people that they furloughed. Certainly, a lot of the part-time workers who are on unemployment insurance will continue with their part-time work. A lot of self-employed workers on unemployment insurance will continue being self-employed. I hope some small businesses will start seeing these loans. I, like I was saying earlier, I haven't seen a single small business that I personally know that has gotten a small business loan. All I, I can, if I Google it, there's a list of $70 billion companies that got small business loans because they're treating each local division of the company like a separate small business, which is ludicrous. So small businesses are not getting helped and their employees are getting screwed. So, but once again, I do think so many states, you know, if, if you look at New York City and New Jersey, those two, I said this the other day, those two states together are more than the other 48 states combined in terms of the number of coronavirus deaths. So Georgia, which is reopening their economy today, Georgia has over 10 million people. There's 843, 840 deaths in Georgia. And you always have to say every death is, you know, sad. And that's true. But a lot of these people are elderly. I'm not saying that excuses anything. The biggest difference, by the way, between the flu and the coronavirus is that the flu kills children. The coronavirus kills the elderly, which is why they spent, which is why ventilator time is longer, and the ventilators don't necessarily even hope help because they're already elderly. They were they're on their last. They already had pre-existing conditions. So, Georgia, with 10 million people and only 800 or so deaths, let them reopen their economy. Let's see what happens. Why does everyone? Why is there's so many bad things happening with the economic shutdown? You know, I just, I, you know. If you count up, I think somebody did a study in the Great Depression, and by the way, I take it with a grain of salt, but for every 1% in GDP lost, an extra 40,000 people died. If you look at that model, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people are potentially at risk right now for every single month the economy is shut down. So I don't think that's very fair. I don't think, and I feel like it's become political. So I feel like if, if you're on one side of things, you want the economy to open up right away. And if you're on the other side of things, you want the economy to stay shut down until at least there's a vaccine. Are you kidding me? There's not going to be a vaccine for at least 12 to 18 months. I kind of think there's never going to be a vaccine. We've been looking for a vaccine for the common cold for 50 years. Well, the, the common cold is a coronavirus. This coronavirus, COVID-19, is a mutation of the, of the common cold, essentially. It's like the common cold but it's a little, it's more fatal. So you can't come up with a vaccine for the common cold. How are they gonna magically come up with a vaccine for this? We're not even sure about immunity levels yet. Are you immune for a month? Are you immune for a year? Are you immune for 10 years? Are we all gonna be lining up for vaccines at the drugstore every year after this? I don't know. Even if you're over, this is the, this is the thing. Even if you're over 70 years old, you're not going to die from coronavirus most likely, Every, if I say on Twitter right now, let's reopen the economy, someone will respond to me, oh, and all your grandparents are gonna die and you're cool with that? No, I'm not cool with that. But only two out of 100,000 people over the age of 70 are dying from coronavirus. Two out of 100,000. I would, I would take those odds. If I, was, if I was 80 years old, I would go outside and go to the grocery store and go to the park and go to a... Uh, a, a comedy club, maybe, unless the comedians were bad. And so, so why is everybody comparing opening up the economy with me killing my grandmother? First off, my grandmother's dead, but let's say I had one. And let's say I liked her. You know, you, you, don't, you, know, you don't necessarily, you have to balance, when you're making a decision about the entire US economy, which is a $20 trillion economy, $20 trillion, it's not about money, it's about people's lives. Again, 
there are deaths happening, there are abuses cases happening, there are suicides happening. Let's see what happens in Georgia. And again, don't be gleeful if there are deaths in Georgia proving you right. Let's hope you're wrong. If you're against the economy reopening, I get it. I understand your reasoning. Let's hope that you're wrong so that the economy reopens, few, as few people as possible are at risk, and we get back to a normal society. A couple months ago, I said, if we're not opened up by early April, the long-term economy could be really damaged. Now, because of the stimulus packages, I do think that buys us into May, you know, hopefully the first week of May. But I do think if we don't start reopening things, we're not going to really, the new normal is going to turn into the new abnormal. Hysteria is going to become history and we're going to be probably in trouble here. You know, some of the bad things that are going to happen is all the, we know for a fact, WeWork's going to go out of business. So that means all commercial real estate in every city is going to collapse. There's probably going to be a mini financial collapse after the economy reopens, which is why I wouldn't be so eager to just blanket by the economy, you know, by the stock market. Many restaurants are gonna go out of business. I know no, nobody I know got a small business loan. Uh, and a lot of people just are not, gonna, are not gonna open up again for a while. Uh, movie theaters are not gonna be crowded. Uh, sports events are not gonna be crowded. What, no matter what anybody says, sports event, not everyone's gonna say, say, I can't wait to go into a Petri dish of disease called Yankee Stadium. Not everybody's gonna say that. So let's see what happens. We're gonna hope for the best, but you, you, at this point, the worst case scenario is not about the coronavirus. It was never the case that millions of people were gonna die. It was never the case that 200,000 people were gonna die. All of those mathematical models were wrong. Just like in 2006, all the mathematical models were saying it's impossible for more than 1% of mortgages to, to go out of business. It's impossible, but it happened. So that's all the mathematical models are, are almost always wrong. So let's actually see what happens. Georgia's gonna reopen, Texas is gonna start reopening, other uh, states are gonna reopen, and then you're gonna see a race of governors. Who could open fastest? By the way, Jay, if you're on, I forgot my Gmail password, so please text me the questions on Twitter if you can. I will check my Twitter texts and I'll answer questions from there. But while I've been here, I've been thinking of book ideas that you could do in less than 30 days. Let's say you're gonna stay home for the next 30 days. I have an idea for you that everybody could do, and everybody could do the exact same idea, but you will write completely different books using the exact same technique. You'll be able to write this book in 30 days, and, uh, and you'll be able to publish it within 30 days. And just a little story, one time when, um, I guess it was uh, Prince uh, William and, and Kate had a baby, George, I decided just for the fun of it, I'm going to write an entire book in a weekend and publish it. I'm gonna start on Friday, publish it on Amazon, self-publish it on Amazon by Sunday, and it's gonna be published. And so I wrote the, um, their, their kid's name, uh, Prince William's kid's name was George, Prince George. And so I wrote the autobiography of Prince George. And he was three days old at the time. And so I wrote the autobiography written in his voice of a three day old baby. And it's on Amazon. Let me see if that's the exact title. Uh, I don't know how old he is now. Uh, and I, I, I wrote it under a pseudonym. So no one would suspect it's me. Yeah, I wrote the autobiography of Prince George Alexander Lewis Windsor and it's the autobiography at the age of three days old, and it's by, the author is George Alexander Lewis Windsor, Prince George, but with a foreword by John Kenneth Rowling, AKA JK Rowling. So the book has actually, I didn't even know this, has 10 ratings, it's got five reviews, including at least one one-star review, and uh, here's, a, here's a three-star review. Not bad for a three-day old baby. This is perhaps not the most insightful autobiography ever written, but it's not bad considering it was written by a baby who was only three days old. I think I didn't fool her, but uh, let's see. One star. Uh, suggestions. Uh, so there's a one star review by someone who I think is from England because he wrote on the review, rubbish. Suggestions in this book are crude and ludicrous. I would not recommend it to anyone, even if I thought it was a freebie. So... Uh, Oh, and here's another one, written in the UK. One star, absolute rubbish. Well, 
You can't wear them all. I wrote it in just three days. But it did get one, two, uh, three, four, three, four reviews that were either five star or four star. So not so bad. And wrote it and published it in three days. So here's my idea. Everybody loves books about habits. So as an example, if you think of James Clear, he's written an excellent book called Atomic Habits and it's been on the bestseller list. He's doing a real good job. Another friend of mine, Cal Newport, has written about study habits. Uh, he wrote a book called Deep Work, which has done really well. So people love books about improving habits and getting new habits. So th keep that in mind, the word habits. Now, there are, there are websites out there with, oh, someone asked on the autobiography of Prince George, how many sales? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think it was about 150 sales and not a lot, but 150 for a book I did in a weekend. And it's, it's length is only 31 pages. So in, on Amazon, you don't, you're not limited. You don't have to write a 250 page book. You can write a 30 page book. You know, nobody that will sell. Sometimes the 30 page books sell better than the 500 page books. And you just have to ask, my good friend, Kamal Ravikant, who might even be on this IG Live, he wrote a book in 2011 um, or 2012, uh, Love Your Life, uh, Love Yourself as if you're, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends on It. And he sold like a million books and it's, it's about, whoops. Oh, I almost dropped, I almost dropped the phone because I'm talking so loud, my sound waves. Are you there? All right, so I almost dropped the whole phone. Good thing I caught it. Uh, Kamal Ravikant wrote a book, it's like 20 or 30 pages long, he sold like a million copies. So page length doesn't matter if you self-publish on Amazon. But here's my idea, keep in mind the word habits. Now think of your favorite hobby. So do you like golf? Do you like watching TV? Do you like um, other sports? Do you like other games? Do you like uh, cooking? Do you like, I don't know, what are some hobbies that people like? What's your favorite hobby? Do you like working? Do you like writing? Do you like um, public speaking? So keep that in mind. Go to a website, ssrn.com. That's Sally, Sally, Ruth, Nancy.com. And it's, uh, they looks like they changed the design, but tomorrow's research today. So on SSRN, it says they have 925,389 research papers from 475,000 researchers in more than 50 disciplines. So let's say I type in, and I'm just, I don't even know what's gonna happen. Maybe nothing will happen. But let's say I type in habits about golf. Okay, I don't play golf. I don't give a shit about golf. But what if I loved golf and I wanted to write a book about how to build up good habits for golf? So I, I go to ssrn.com, I type in habits and golf. And, um, there's not a lot of answers for that one, actually. So let me, I'll do another search. So how do I build habits for golf? Uh, and so there's all these websites, how to create better golf habits, seven habits of successful golfers, three essentials for creating a, a, a golf habit. And let's say I get a little bit more specific. Like let's say I say, oh, what if I wanna build leg, leg strength in golf? Okay, now it starts to be, I'm starting to get to some academic research about proven research studies for boosting leg strength among golfers. And by the way, if you play golf, then one of the most important things you need to do, what Tiger Woods did that nobody else did was he exercised his legs more than any other golfer. So you start finding the academic research, go to ssrn.com, go to other research sites and type in habits, type in your subject, and you'll see all sorts of research papers. I'm determined to find one. Let's say, um, I'm just gonna type in habits in general into SSRN, and uh, let's see what happens. Habits. Okay, so here's a, here's a research paper uh, done at the University of Virginia. What makes entrepreneurs entrepreneurial? And here's another one. Uh, uh, Punctuality, a, a, a key cultural trait at MIT. Uh, here's one, the five C's of credit in the lending industry. Uh, uh, the perils of social reading. So all these are habits relating, or here's one, the legal writer's checklist manifesto. So uh, all of these are habits 
about entrepreneurship or other things relating to entrepreneurship. So let's say you want to write a, a book, the 30, the, the, the 30 must have habits for entrepreneurs. Take a different research paper a day. It's in all this scientific jargon with all this math, translate it to layman's terms, find one example from history. Like I just gave you an example of Walt Disney and persistence earlier. Find one example from history, write one habit a day and one example and quote one research paper. In 30 days, you'll have 30 chapters with 30 great case studies and 30 great proven research examples. And now you have a book. How do you get a cover? You go to 99designs.com, you pay $100 for someone to make a cover for you, and now you can upload it to Amazon. You can self-publish it. And then your book, by you, the, mo the 30 most important habits for entrepreneurs, or you could call it the one month entrepreneur, a new habit a day for 30 days, whatever you wanna call it. You could publish your book in a month, and it's easy. That's all you have to do. So uh, let me see, let me type in, uh, uh, another category. I'll type in, and again, I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna type cooking. Hopefully there'll be some papers or I'll be a little embarrassed. Okay. Uh, oh no, this is about cooking, cooking the books. A lot of academic research about fraud here. So, uh, uh. Mm. Yeah, negotiation recipes for success. Okay, but here's a good one. Here's a paper, cooking up a deal. Negotiation recipes for success. So, uh, you know, 30 days to being a better negotiator. So you can write an entire book about negotiation. If I, that's a, that's a much better idea. I'm gonna type in negotiation. Everybody wants to negotiate better. Everybody wants to persuade better. Uh, uh, yeah, so negotiation via email. The importance of communication scales in negotiation. So that's a paper from Australia. Uh, the negotiation via email is from Creighton University Graduate School. Uh, uh, why we engage, how theories of human behavior contribute to our understanding of negotiation. That's from the Berkman Center Research. Negotiating cloud contracts, that's from Queen Mary School. Uh, what do people value when they negotiate? MIT. So there's all these research papers about SSRN. Uh, there's all these research papers about negotiation at SSRN.com. Again, they're all about something different. They're all heavily academic, like this one's MIT, this one's some graduate school, this one's the uh, uh, University of Cambridge. So there's all these high level scientific research done on the best habits and, and ways to negotiate and persuade. And take 30, uh, break, it, break each research paper down into layman terms, like a, a couple paragraphs, just one page, two pages. This is what this paper says about negotiation. And it's a, from this MIT research, they did this study, this is what happened. This is what it means. This is the actionable takeaway. And then do a case study from real life, either from your own personal life or research a situation where it might've happened in real life. Like again, take an example from Thomas Edison. Take an example from Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss had to negotiate uh, how many words, you know, because Dr. Seuss was writing children's books, he had to negotiate exactly how many words of vocabulary he was gonna use per book. So take examples from Dr. Seuss from whoever, and every day, new research study, an example that, a real life example that shows how that research is at work and, and it works. Within 30 days, you'll have about 60 pages, you'll have 30 different techniques to be a better negotiator, and you could publish your, and then go to 99designs.com, say I need a cover, I'm gonna pay $100, and in 30 days, you'll have a cover, you'll have 60 pages, 30 chapters, and it'll actually be a good book because you'll actually be helping people be a better negotiator. So that is, I can tell you for sure, I've known people who have done this technique. I know one guy who's written over a hundred books and he's written so many books, he's had to use four or five different names, maybe more. And each book doesn't make a lot of money, but on average, his books make about $500 a month per book, right? So. So $500 per month per book, and it took him a couple years, but he wrote 100 books, okay? You know, he wrote two or three books a month, by the way. So over a year or so, he wrote 100 books, and so now 100 times 500 is $50,000. He's making 50, and I'm not even joking around, he's making $50,000 a month. This was two years ago when I spoke, last spoke to him. 
he was making $50,000 a month uh, from just an average of $500 a book per month. And he was just sitting there, Amazon would send him a check once a month, and he's still writing books. He writes books about habits. He writes books about negotiation. He writes books about entrepreneurship. He writes books about cleaning your house. Um, I'm gonna type in, uh, and you know what? This, I'm just using, I'm using SSRN, Sally, Sally, Ruth, Nancy, dot com, and there, but there are other sites like this. This one has a million research papers from half a million scientists. I'm gonna write, what's another thing I should type in? Let's call it, uh, 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 um, I don't know, there's negotiation. What about persuasion? Which is a little bit different than negotiation. Here we go. The minimum persuasive effects of campaign contact in elections. Okay, and that's uh, from Stanford. Social media, political polarization, and political disinformation. A review of the scientific literature. So it's from NYU. Uh, uh, the psychology of malware warnings. Oh, that's fascinating. Malware warnings are usually scams. Why are they negotiate? Why are they persuading you to click certain buttons? That's probably fascinating research. Uh, visual analysis of images in brand culture. So that's probably an interesting, that comes from the Rochester Institute of Technology. What is visual analysis of images in brand culture? It probably means when you look at a, a logo or an advertisement, where do, where do your eyes focus on? Do they focus on the pretty girl? Do they focus on the product? Do they focus on the language? What words stand out? So this is how you persuade people using visual imagery. So think of, um, you know, uh, here, let's find another one. How to um, post-it note persuasion, a sticky influence. And that's in the Journal of Con Consumer Psychology. The author's from Sam Houston State University. Scam compliance and the psychology of persuasion. That's from the University of Exeter. Media and political persuasion from the American Economic Review, and on and on. So, again, you can write every day, take a research paper, translate it to layman's language, just in a couple paragraphs. Say, oh, there was this research done. Here's what they concluded. Here's your actionable takeaway, and then do a real life case study from either your life or from history. And boom, in 30 days, you have 30 chapters, maybe 60 pages. You have a cover you'll get from 99designs.com and now you have a book on persuasion. Uh, so that is my 30 day book tutorial. I, I have, if you're, if you like this, uh, if you like these book challenges, tweet out that you like it and I will do another one tomorrow. I can probably do one every day of this week and next, another 30 day book challenge. And again, why is this interesting? Well, A, a lot of people like to write books, but they just never realized, oh, I don't need an agent. I don't need a publisher. I don't need an editor. I don't need a bookstore. I can just, and I don't need to write 250 pages, which trust me is painful to write. Write a 30 page book, write a 60 page book. I just gave you a technique for writing a 60 page book in 30 days. You could write, you could write this book on your, if you take a train to work, write this book on a train to work. So I have one friend, um, David Levine, he's a co-writer on, um, he, he's the co-writer on uh, Billions, one of the writers of the TV show Billions. So David Levine used to take the subway, not the subway, the train from, I guess, Connecticut into New York City every day for his work. And he was just so disgusted with himself. Everybody was sleeping and he was reading the paper. He said, I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna write a page a day. Well, in a year, he wrote his first mystery novel and he's got a whole mystery novel series now that's published by a mainstream publisher and is in the bookstores. So if you just write a small page or two a day using this technique I outlined, the SSRN technique, but there are other sites other than just SSRN, you'll have a book in 30 days uh, and you'll be able to upload it to Amazon. So uh, I'll have another one tomorrow. Let me see if Jay has sent the messages. Uh, he has, thank you, Jay. So do you think it's naive to start a business at this time? No, I think I think it's probably naive to launch a business. Like I wouldn't open up a pizza restaurant today because there's an economic shutdown, but start thinking about businesses you can start and start doing the groundwork. So I have an idea for a game. Um, it's similar to the Cards Against Humanity game. And I've been working on what all the parts and components of the game are and what the design is. And you know, I've been studying how I wanna launch this on Kickstarter. So. 
it, now is the best time to think about launching a business because here's what's gonna happen. When, when people, when the economy reopens, people are still gonna wanna stay home. They're gonna, and a lot of people are still gonna do social isolation. So figure out what businesses are gonna do well. So book sales, Amazon announced, book sales are up 700%. Well, using this technique I just told you, you could start writing 10, 20, you'll have 30 books. Using this technique I told you, you could write 30 books in the next two years, right? And so if each book, again, makes $500 a book on average per month, which is not a lot, you'll make $15,000 a month. That's a good business. Why don't you write a book that takes all the classics and, and, and all the main SAT essays about those classics and you write the answers to all those SAT essays and boom, you have a, a book for each classic book. So if we self, here's a great question. If we self publish, can we sell it to a publisher later? Yes, a great example. I gave you the example earlier of Kamal Ravikant's book, uh, Love Yourself uh, Like Your Life Depends On It. He self published that in 2011 or 2012. He published that with Harper, I, uh, I actually forget who his publisher was, but a real big publisher. He just published it, I think William Morrow maybe, or, or maybe it was Harper Collins. Uh, he just published it as a regularly published book. Will the second wave come during the flu season and be worth worse? Who knows? There's, do you, when, you, when flu season comes, do you isolate yourself? No, you just hope that you don't get the flu. And if someone is coughing, you stay away from them. And if you start having symptoms, you stay home. Do the same thing with coronavirus. Don't forget, a very small percentage of the population, flu-like percentages uh, came, came down and then had severe symptoms and died from coronavirus as the flu. There's a big difference between coronavirus and the flu. Coronavirus, the flu affects children more. Coronavirus affects elderly people more. So take into consideration the differences. But there is going to be a second wave probably, or who knows. But you can't stop, you can't just shut down life. This is not... This is not the Spanish flu. This is not smallpox. So when, when, when smallpox, so the Europeans had kind of a weird herd immunity to smallpox. And they weren't completely immune, but they were a little bit immune. So they were able to, when they came over to uh, what became known as North America, the Americas, for the first few years, they brought, their biggest export was smallpox. The problem with smallpox is Everyone got it, like all of the Native Americans got it. You know, there were 60 million Native Americans in North America when the Europeans were here, or when the Europeans first got here. 60 million Native Americans, 50 million died almost immediately from diseases like smallpox and the plague. They brought the plague with them. Nobody, nobody wants the plague. This coronavirus is not the plague, all right? The, the plague, the, I don't, the plague would make you have these huge blisters that would grow to the size of melons all over your body and then they would burst and you would bleed to death. This is not the plague. That was a bad pandemic. We don't have the plague right now. Smallpox has been eradicated. Even the measles has been eradicated. Uh, James, I'm a 37 year old divorce attorney. I wanna change careers. I'm the primary breadwinner with an 18 month old da daughter. No time for high, side hustles. Advice, thanks for everything you do. Well. That's a good question. So you're a divorce attorney and you have a, you're the primary breadwinner, no time for side hustles. I get it, so that means, I get it, I understand. So you're at work all day being a lawyer and now you're, uh, uh, you'd like to qu change careers. So look, even, even when I had a full-time job, I started a business and it took me, it took me 18 months to quit my full-time job. So the first thing I would recommend is don't just have an idea and then quit your job. Like for instance, I had an idea about a game and it's not like I'm only gonna do that game because I haven't, yet, I haven't done any experiments to see if my idea will work. You have to be able to experiment pretty heavily enough to see if it works long enough to quit your job. So continue doing your job and I get it, you don't have time for side hustles, but during the workday, do you really feel like you work the full eight or nine hours? Like what happens if you don't take a lunch break? What happens if you don't, you know, gossip with friends at work. And I'm not saying you do, I'm not saying you have any of these habits, but the average worker, this is a funny statistic, the average worker, uh, uh, the, the average worker works only two hours and 53 minutes on an eight hour workday. So let's say your workday is nine to five. They've studied like thousands of people who have nine to five jobs. The average worker works less than three hours. The other time is spent 
on social media, you know, gossiping on new, you know, web news sites, you know, sending emails to friends and family. I'm not saying you do that, but first check your time. Like put maybe an attachment on your computer to see where you spend your time and really take note what kind of time you need. Maybe you just need a half hour a day. Here's what I would suggest. Right now, I think you could build a new business, but that's a little bit of effort. So let's, let's start with divorce. So there's a lot of things you've learned about being a divorce lawyer that maybe put up an ad on Facebook just as an experiment, put an ad up, target people in your city, target people who are married, and say, look, uh, free divorce advice from a divorce attorney, call, make an appointment here. And set up a, a page where they can make an appointment to call you on the phone. Then they call you on the phone and they might be really unsure whether to have a divorce. And then maybe, you know, you could say, okay, the first call was free. And if you gave really good advice, like don't forget to do this with your money, put it in a trust. Don't forget to do this with his credit cards. Don't forget to do this with your health or this or this or this. Uh, don't forget to document uh, his affairs and emails and stuff like that. So let's say you give really good advice and then they say, oh, this is great. Can I talk to you again? Well, now you charge. $200 for the next phone call or $300 for the next phone call. You're a lawyer and you're allowed to give advice and you don't, and you could set up a divorce advice service on the side. Anyway, that's just a segue. That's not a side hustle. That's just a segue into something new. But let's say now you really want to do something new. What if you create a website about divorce or, or let's say, you know what? Well, let's say you created, I described the kind of referral service you could create, but let's say you created for every city, you will get the searcher, uh, you will buy the search engine terms for St. Louis, divorce, Kansas City, divorce, Philadelphia, divorce, Pittsburgh, divorce. And when people get to the site, you, they could call you for a referral. You could describe who you are and then you refer a law firm and you work out a deal with each, with law firms in each city. They'll give you $500 for everybody or $100 or $300 for everyone you refer, you can make a solid 10 to 20,000 a month doing that. And I know this because I know people who've done similar things, just not in divorce law, but lawyers will pay absolutely pay referral fees. So the other thing you can do is what I just described about books. You could start writing a book every month and boom, suddenly you're making steady income from 50 or 60 books that you have out there. Or go to, here's a, here's a good, suggestion, go to empireflippers.com, empireflippers, F-L-I-P-P-E-R-S.com. There are all these e-commerce websites for sale. Usually they're for sale for really low prices. Well, buy one of those sites and improve it. See what site resonates with you. You're, let's say you're really into cooking and there's an e-commerce website about cooking and you have ideas about how to improve it. Let's say they don't have a mobile app and you think, oh, I can make a mobile app. Let's say they don't take affiliate fees by, re by referring people to grocery stores for ingredients. Well, I could put in affiliate fees. So you come with all these ways to improve the profits on that site and you buy the site. A lot of these sites are available for very cheap. And I have a podcast coming out on Monday, which describes how you could buy a, a business for super cheap, even zero. So it's almost better to buy an existing business than to start one, but I just gave you two ideas for either starting one or buying an existing one, plus the book idea. I'll have more ideas as we go along. Will people move out of the big cities and relocate to the exurbs? Yes, absolutely. I'm even thinking of moving out of New York City. I'm even thinking of moving out of New York City further away than the suburbs or whatever. So I don't know, New York City was locked down. I mean, there was somebody arrested yesterday in Central Park who had kids with them. So New York, de blasio de blasio will put up a phone number if you see someone breaking social distancing f take their photo and send the image to this phone number he got all sorts of images of he got all these dick pics to that phone number and all these hitler images so it didn't really work out that well but whatever um what do you think the jobless claims number reported will be it'll be about between four and five million uh and again remember what i said about employment numbers last week it's not uh, it's not true. It's not truly the unemployed. Don't forget now because of the stimulus, it's uh, uh, part-time workers, self-employed workers, furloughed workers. So take the actual number with a grain of salt. What's really going to be important is how many people are going back to work when this shutdown ends. Uh, how do you choose a good business to buy on Flippa? 
that's uh, worthy of a, uh, an entire session. But the first thing is, do your due diligence and make sure the website or the business is not falling apart. Like, make sure they're not selling it because everything's about to, go, to disappear. Also, you wanna make sure that the website takes minimum amount of time from you. So find out exactly how much of the website's business depends on the owner who's selling it to you. Because if it depends a lot on him, like it's all his relationships, then you don't wanna be, you don't wanna buy that business. Another important thing is, is how much profit do you earn, you know, as a percentage of the amount you pay. Ideally, you don't want it to be lower than 40%. It's like putting money in a savings account where instead of getting 0.1% interest, you get 40% interest. So make sure it's at least 40% the profits, your annual profits versus the amount you pay and do the enough due diligence, like research, background checks, everything to make sure you're going to get that, that 40%, the business is not gonna tank and make sure uh, you know how to run the business if his employees leave or whatever. What will happen to live entertainment? That's a great question because uh, I'm asking that myself. I own a comedy club and I do stand-up comedy. I mean, right before the shutdown started, I was all over the Netherlands. Actually, during this shutdown, I was supposed to do stand-up comedy in Miami, DC, Pittsburgh, Winnipeg, California, Houston, and Austin, and not to mention New York City. And all of that got canceled. So I am curious what's gonna happen with live entertainment. Unfortunately, I don't think it's gonna be great, but here's the way I look at it. It's like a drug addict. A drug addict will go to rehab and maybe they get over their drug addiction while they're in rehab. But when they get out of rehab and they start hanging out in the same places with the same friends, they're going back to drugs. Like it's 99% chance they're going to start using drugs again. I think that I'm hoping that's what happens to the economy. The economic shutdown is like our rehab. We're in home right now to get us somehow off of our economy drug and uh, I hope that when the economy reopens, and I think this is partially true, we'll get back into the habit of our usual habits of spending, going out. Look, people have to take people out on dates. Oh, someone asked, will I retweet the books we published from this book challenge? Absolutely. If you write a book with the book challenge I just gave using you know research on, on all any of these things and writing a book, but you have to do it. I'll give you a few extra days. You have to do it within 33 days of today. I'm giving you time to get the cover done and time to figure out how to self-publish on Amazon, which shouldn't take you more than an hour or two, I will retweet and even list in an article, send out to my 250,000 people on my email list, I will retweet all the people who self-publish books uh, using this specific challenge. Am I writing new jokes? Uh, a little bit, but it's hard, it's hard to think about jokes right now because everything's coronavirus. All of the media is coronavirus. So there's lots of absurd things that I see. Like why was Dr. Fauci on a podcast the other day recommending people go to Tinder? Like what sort of, is that, what sort of, is he on Tinder? What sort of social distancing is he recommending? It's not a joke, it's a premise, but it's just, you, first you start to notice what's absurd and then you kind of find the twist. Maybe I could, maybe the joke is, what, Dr. Fauci is on podcast recommending Tinder? A, that's not social distancing. B, why is he on all these podcasts instead of making a vaccine? And C, I don't want what People Magazine calls the sexiest man alive competing with me on Tinder. That might be more joke format as an example of how I think about a joke. By the way, I don't go on Tinder. I have a wife. I'm not getting a divorce. Don't worry. Um, what's my take on how the federal government is handling this? I don't really know. I think this was an opportunity for everybody from Pelosi to Donald Trump, to uh, everybody, to be a profile in courage and to be smart and say, hey, uh, I don't care about being reelected. I just wanna do the right thing. Let's get all the data, let's do the right thing. I'm not gonna handle, I'm not gonna deal with criticism. I'm just gonna think about what's the right thing today and get as much good data as possible. I feel too many people are caring about this election. Like a few weeks ago, someone called me up I won't, it was a well-known person, but I don't want to say who. And he was arguing with me because I was talking about the collateral fatalities of this economic shutdown. People can't get elective cancer uh, procedures done because it's all coronavirus while the hospitals are, are technically shut down, while the economy is shut down. And he even said to me, the important thing is this next election is about Trump versus no Trump. And I'm like, okay, I get it. But is that why you're against reopening the economy, which is hurting 300 million people. 
Is that the whole basis of your opinion? I mean, your whole reason you called me was not about the actual health of people or even about the economy. You just want people to suffer so that somebody is either elected or not elected. Like enough with, I hope there's no more political parties after this. You know, the, the people who created the constitution, they didn't want political parties. There's no political parties mentioned in the constitution. It just became a shortcut for people to know who to vote for. Oh, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican or I'm a Federalist or whatever. It, was a, it became this weird shortcut that started pretty early on, but there was no reason for political parties. They're not, it's not law that there should be political parties. Uh, advice on publishing via pseudonym on like a fake name on Amazon? Use your real name unless, I mean, I used a pseudonym for that. I told you about my classic novel that I wrote in three days, the autobiography of Prince George Alexander Lewis Windsor, which is the, was the prince when he was three days old. Uh, I, I told you about that and I used a pseudonym because I was a little embarrassed about the quality of it, but maybe I should even have put it in my name. Uh, any ideas how to get more PPE into the hands of healthcare workers? Yes, if you tweet out to me what city you're in and, and just say you have PPE for healthcare workers, how can I get it to them? I will respond and, and help you. So there's various charities in every city that are helping healthcare workers get PPE. By the way, why don't the hospitals have enough surgical equipment, uh, surgical gowns and, and surgical masks. It's not, so, so Burberry and Zara, the two clothing companies, they've pivoted, they were smart. They pivoted their whole business to uh, uh, create surgical masks. They no longer make dresses, they make surgical masks and surgical gowns. So it's not rocket science to make these things. I just don't know why hospitals don't have enough and I don't know why there's not enough made. But if you have some PPE, then uh, tweet it out and I'll help you. Uh, what's the best way to promote a book? The absolute best way to promote a book, to, besides me, besides coming on my podcast or me retweeting it, which by the way, my podcast is a big choice for book publicists, the best way to promote a book is to write your second book. Because your first book's only gonna be okay, your second book might be your great book. And then once, once you have one book that's a hit, all the books you wrote before then become hits. So. A friend of mine uh, who's been on my podcast, Hugh Howie, he wrote the series Wool, it's a science fiction series. Wool has sold millions of copies. It was a national bestseller and a uh, worldwide bestseller. And once I even read that series, and by the way, it was self-published, and then Simon & Schuster republished it, and I think it's even got a movie deal. But once he self-published that book, I went back and I read all of his books. It was so good, and then all of his books were good. They had sold almost nothing until Wool came out, and Wool was like his 20th book. So the best way to market a book is to, um, is to write the second book. Uh, you got two job offers, startups or corporates in this current market, it just depends. So you have to do what you love doing. Don't think about the money. When I took my very first job, and I'll, oh, I have one minute and 58 seconds left according to Instagram. I had two job offers when I moved to the New York City in, in 1994. I had a job offer from HBO for 40,000 a year, and I had a job offer from JP Morgan for 80,000 a year, double the money, 80,000 a year. For 40,000 a year, I couldn't afford to live in New York City. With 80,000, I would be able to. I took the HBO job because I didn't want to work at a bank. I, didn't, I hated the idea of working in a bank. I loved HBO's TV shows, so I took the job at HBO. So doing what you, the job you love with people you like being around is more important than startup or corporate. Later on, you could think about the money and then do startup. You're gonna make more money in a startup. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, at first, do what you love. So anyway, one minute left. I will save this on my IG stories in the live and I'll also upload it within the next day to YouTube. Tomorrow, if you want, I'll do another book challenge or I'll do more business ideas and do some stuff about the economy and politics and all sorts of stuff. Thanks for sending your questions and thanks for being on this. 52 seconds left, I'm gonna share this immediately on IG stories if you hit the live button and then I'll send this over to Jay and he'll load it to my YouTube. And thanks so much, see you tomorrow, 2 p.m.